I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Spandrew Spice. Welcome to Deep Cuts, the podcast where we pick a topic and walk you through the ins, the outs, and the nitty gritty so you can appear like an interesting and idiosyncratic person at your next forced social function. Today's topic is... Fred Rogers. Who was Fred Rogers? Well, he was better known as Mr. Rogers from the beloved PBS show Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, which he not only created, but was the showrunner and host of. He was a lifelong registered Republican, an ordained Presbyterian minister, helped save PBS when Nixon tried to cut funding, and somehow ended up saving porn. Act 1. Loneliness and Cardigans. Fred McFeely Rogers was born on March 20th, 1928, in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, to James Hillis Rogers and Nancy McFeely Rogers. James was a very successful businessman who was the president of the McFeely Brick Company, one of Latrobe's largest businesses. Nancy knitted sweaters for American soldiers from western Pennsylvania who were fighting in Europe and regularly volunteered at the Latrobe Hospital. Fred was named after Nancy's father, Fred Brooks McFeely, who was an entrepreneur. Fred spent most of his childhood alone, playing with puppets and spending time with his grandfather. He began playing the piano when he was five. His parents adopted a daughter, Elaine, when he was 11. He is also a sixth cousin to Tom Hanks, American actor who portrays Fred in the 2019 movie A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Tom Hanks is also a direct descendant of Abraham Lincoln, and as is Casper Van Dien. So we got fucking... Casper Van Dien, we got fucking Mr. Rogers, we got Tom Hanks just all up in the mix in the in the in the in the stir fryer of of the primordial soup. This story like catches on and a movie gets written like kind of like the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, where Abraham Lincoln is played by a bunch of people at different points in his life and Casper Van Dien and uh tom hanks play him but after they leave the role they get so enamored with the chin strap beard style they bring it back and they wear it in their real life which ignites a media firestorm about should we be embracing the chin strap the hairstyle facial uh facial styling descendant straight from slavery and, and slave owners and shit and it starts this weird debate and then there's like a alt-right uh an alt-right outgrowth of this that all starts growing chin strap beards and the world just becomes like chin strap obsessed and it's all linked back to just you being like did you know they're cousins we have to delete this episode (laughs) it's not worth it you you say as we both stroke our chin strap beards yes that just grew in like those push play-doh things As we spoke, Rogers had a lonely childhood. He was shy, introverted, and overweight, and he was frequently homebound after suffering bouts of asthma. Worst of all, he was bullied as a child for his weight. He attended Latrobe High School, where he overcame his shyness. He told NPR, It was tough for me at the beginning, and then I made a couple friends who found out that the core of me was okay, and then one of them was the head of the football team. So... Really quick before we like get into this, and I, I, I think this is kind of maybe a, a bigger, more overarching theme that I don't know if we will or won't touch on. Uh, it's very interesting. Not It's not shocking or surprising or uncommon for this show, but it's very interesting that a man who dedicated his entire life and career to essentially – Telling every kid in America, like, people care about you, you matter, people like you, essentially had a childhood where he had none of that. He was he he was very lonely. He had no siblings to hang out with. Kids made fun of him. He was ostracized up until a certain point. And he's and, and, and I don't think you would like get that from him. Like, I think with a lot of these creators or figures that we talk about. Like oh yeah, like he had you know this person seems like they're they they're they're wearing this trauma on their shoulder, but you would never get that sense from Mister Rogers. He seemed like just the most normal, well-adjusted guy of all time, like an impenetrable fucking uh, gauntlet of I'm normal and I'm not fucked up in any way whatsoever. And yet, if there was a if there was a like a poster for their norm core. It would just be the opening to Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. 
Yeah, and yet, and yet, you we still find this very one to one transference of a very literal childhood trauma to this person trying to very literally fix that for every other kid for the rest of time. Yeah, I mean, I I guess you know when you when you put it in cold black and white like that, it it just makes kind of a logical sense of like, of course, in the same way that uh you know you you know there's there's a clip of Gerard Way on the Sally Jesse Raphael show talking about how comics are for everybody in like 1992, which you know was not a thing, and he's this you know overweight pudgy kid, and you know it's been very public his battles with depression over the last probably half decade or so. It's not hard to understand why that person wants to put on a show for everybody basically making art that says you're not alone and we're all not okay together like let's be let's just take solace in that and try and you know be there for each other and heal you know like it's not a it's not a wild uh supposition to be like oh yeah the guy who said what if we made a band that was a combination of the smiths and and like the misfits would want or come from a, a very sad and, and traumatic place, you know, a, a very real personal pain, you know, makes sense to me. Yeah. But I also think it, I, I also think it's very interesting to think about how that had an effect on the actual work. Um, I don't know if we'll I don't know if we'll talk about this now or or later. I was at some point just going to talk about like our experiences with this show. So I don't know what your how what your experience actually. <laughs> uh, I said this off pod, but. I think it's very funny. We've talked about this on previous episodes, but it's you and I are similar in a lot of ways. But I think that there are key differences, obviously, that sort of reveal themselves as as people get to know us better or when we talk to each other uh, more and more. Uh, And one of them that I find very funny is, as you famously talked about on the show many times before, when you were a little kid, your hero was Freddy Krueger. And you just like daydreamed about hanging out with Freddy Krueger and like murdering people, I guess. Um, whereas when I was a kid, my hero was Mr. Rogers. And I and I was like separated by only a thin stretch of desert between the uh the 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 suburbs of Arizona and the suburbs of New Mexico. Uh where whereas you were just like, it's prime time, bitch. Um just like looking out at the same moon, I was looking up at that same moon and think and saying, "Mr. Rogers, will you be my dad?" <laughs> uh, I mean, one, I feel like it's a little oversimplification. I think that it says more about the the brilliant writing of Freddy Krueger that I, as a young person, related with him and was like, "This is great. I want to hang out with Freddy Krueger." Uh, but also. Uh yeah man I I loved Mr. Rogers too. I was I was obsessed with all of that PBS stuff. I was I was the crazy person who even liked Barney and like fucking Lamb Chops when I was little. Like in hindsight Lamb Chops is fucking that's a weird scary show. Like that is not cool. That's a great point cuz it's basically that that's a great pivot to what I my point that I was going to make which is yeah, for sure. I mean, I didn't I didn't really like Barney that much. My brother loved Barney. I, I kind of didn't like Barney because there were some things that he was obsessed with that because he watched them so much, I kind of was annoyed by them. Uh, and yeah, I, I liked Lamb Chop as well. I, I watched that as well. And obviously there's tons of children's programming. Um, there's stuff that's like of our time and maybe after our time. Like we didn't grow up on the Wiggles. That was more like my sister's era. She's like 20. So like when she was a kid, the wiggles was a thing. Um, and, I, and, but the thing I find interesting is like you watch some of these ch- the children's programming, like you, like there's old shows that were, that's like, that are meant for kids or there's, there's old and new shows that were, that are meant for kids that I genuinely love. Like gravity falls is fucking amazing. Uh, typically like preschool era stuff that it, it goes past the line where it's like, this is not stimulating to me. Like, I do not enjoy this. This is this has gone over a, a, a Rubicon of like being so dumbed down for younger kids that this is not stimulating for an adult. Whereas you can have like shows that are aimed at like 10, 15 year olds that it's like this shit's fucking great. Um, I find it interesting that uh, at least for me, you can go back and watch Mr. Rogers Neighborhood and be genuinely stimulated by it. And like, this is like, I, I'd sit and watch this with my son like 
any day of the week. Uh, I, I've I've watched the show recently with, and I've shown it to my kids and it's a it's just a it's a great show. I mean, it's not something that I would like sit and fucking turn on every day and watch like the X-Files or something like that. But like it it holds up in a, in, and is stimulating as an adult. And I think that that probably has something to do with the fact that like unlike much other children's programming that was maybe, you know, good quality, but it was generated, you know, by a company that was trying to j- create programming for kids um, or fill a time slot or whatever. Mr. Rogers neighborhood was like a singular vision from one man who created the show as we'll get into for the monastic dedication to like a vision of how he wanted to make kids feel about themselves. And I think that that very fact, like, speaks for itself in what the what the show is. It doesn't feel like kids programming. It feels like this fucking like magnum opus from a man who just wanted kids to like feel better about themselves. And I, I think it's that that it speaks for itself in the actual show because you watch it and you're just like, this is fucking great. Like the music, the songs, the it's just it's it's a it's a fucking amazing show. He became president of the student council, a member of the National Honor Society, and editor in chief of the school yearbook. He registered for the draft in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, in 1948 at the age of 20, where he was classified A1, available for military service. However, his status was changed to unqualified for military service following an armed forces physical on October 12, 1950. The Navy SEALs website also confirms he was never a Navy SEAL. And definitely not a sniper. So this is, of course, referring to this age-old internet urban legend that Mr. Rogers was a sniper for, uh, for the Navy SEALs during the Vietnam War and, like, headshotted countless dudes. Um, I mean, on one hand, I would say I'm glad that Mr. Rogers wasn't a cold-blooded murderer. Uh, on the other hand, I would say, oh, maybe it would be a little bit more exciting if that was at least l- a little bit true for this episode. Uh, but either way, Mr. Rogers was not a sniper. That's just, that's not a thing. And also as a side note, there's another famous meme slash urban legend that like Mr. Rogers would like get pissed off when they were filming the show and just like curse and flip people off. And the evidence of this is this picture of him like flipping off the camera. Uh, but that was actually a picture taken out of context. He was doing the, where is Thumpkin song or whatever. And it was back in the 1960s before the middle finger was like really a big thing that people did. Like it wasn't really a thing to flip people off like that. And when you're doing the Where is Thumpkin song, the, your middle finger is tall man. So you say, where is tall man? And you've, you're you holding up your middle finger. So somebody just took a picture of him doing that and was like, look, he's flipping off the camera. It's not true. Uh, I have no knowledge of whatever this song and dance is. But I think it's delightful that you think that I know what this song and dance is. So I'm just going to go, where is Thumpkin? I mean, this is 100% another Chiquita Banana thing, because this is like a very well-known song. Chiquita Banana or Thumpkin Banana. Where is Thumpkin? Where is Thumpkin? Here I am. Here I am. How are you today, sir? Very well, I thank you. Run away, run away. Isn't that Frere Jaca? I mean, it's to the tune of Frere Jaca, but that's that's a that's a thing that people do in like pre- preschool. No knowledge of this. All I know, I'm I'm on that Frere Jaca life, man. I, I don't I don't know about this Willy Thumpkin or whatever the fuck this is. God damn it! This is gonna lead the, every everybody in the group is gonna just barrage us with like. Of course, I know what where his thumpkin is posts the day this comes out, and it's going to lead to me d- accidentally discovering that the where is thumpkin song was written by like the f- fucking pedophile serial killer or something like that, and then we're going to have to do an episode about it. Well, that would be the ultimate answer to where is thumpkin uh, in a maximum security detention facility for filming ten year olds going to town. Yep, coming soon to deep cuts. He attended Dartmouth College for one year before transferring to Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida, where I went to college, incidentally, where he graduated magna cum laude with a Bachelor of Music in 1951. Rogers wanted to enter seminary after college, but instead chose to go into the nascent medium of television after encountering a TV at his parents' home during his senior year at Rollins. 
In a CNN interview, he said, I went into television because I hated it so, and I thought there was a way of using it as a fabulous instrument to nurture those who would watch and listen. But um, other kind of children's shows like Saturday morning cartoons and so forth. Is that good for kids, do you think? I think that that uh, children probably watch a lot of television that isn't good for them. I think that they watch too much television. But when there aren't alternatives, it's very hard to have the, the set turned off. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've got some puppets. Maybe you'd like to ask some of them some questions. Why? <laughs> that was a hard pivot. Uh, yeah, that was that was <laughs> that was Fred Rogers being like, I don't care about this question. I want to do puppet work. That's but that that's actually uh, something that I find very fascinating. So it's a jumping off point of what we were just talking about with like his his vision of what he wanted the show to be. But the other the thing I didn't mention is the interesting thing about Fred Rogers and the show Mr. Rogers Neighborhood is that the reason why he made the show is because he didn't like t TV. He thought TV was bad. He didn't think that kids should be watching TV. And the reason why he made the show because he was a, was because he was essentially like, if they're going to be doing it, which it seems like there's no way to put the genie back in the bottle on that, at least I can put something out there that's going to be a better version of TV that they can watch so that they're not watching bad shit that's going to be bad for them. Um, and I, and I honestly don't, I don't even know if I agree with that necessarily. Um, that's like the one little bit about Mr. Rogers where it, it, it's funny. Cause I, I kind of feel like for me, Mr. Rogers is like the op, the, whatever the opposite of a problematic fave is like, he is, he's just squeaky clean. He's got, he's got nothing wrong with him and he had no bad takes. The man didn't miss and trust me in my adult life i i i, I had that moment that I, i'm sure probably a lot of people had this is maybe like you know five ten years ago who knows how long ago it was where i was like one day i just it just occurred to me mr rogers was like he was like a minister a deeply religious dude he was probably like super homophobic right and i went down the rabbit hole of googling and trying to figure that out and it turns out, as we'll get to later, he was a staunch supporter and ally of the LGBT, LGBTQ community. He, he was like he was untouchable. The one thing, though, the one little thing that I kind of feel like he was a little bit like, eh, maybe you're maybe you got a little too far with this is his whole stance about how like TV is bad and like it's going to rot kids brains. Like an aspect of that is true, like too much screen time is, we've seen from studies and child development data that you, sh you shouldn't just park your kid in front of a TV all day and let them watch uh, shows to pacify them. It, it damages their ability to regulate their emotions and deal with conflict. But like he just like hated TV and thought that it shouldn't exist. And that's his that's his one little thing where I'm like, eh, maybe maybe, maybe you're a little, maybe you're uh, ex uh, overreacting there, Fred. But but yeah, he he uh, he made the show because he didn't like shows and he wanted to like fill the negative space with like something that would be more constructive, which I find interesting. I find interesting that someone would dedicate their entire lives to making a piece of art that they didn't like so that it, at least there was something there that was better. Yeah. It's interesting though. Cause I don't, I don't fully buy the premise that he didn't like TV. I think that to me looks like the more sensationalized version of the pitch that you do in order to sell whatever it is that you're doing. Right. I buy that he thought that the medium had untapped potential, but I don't think you'd spend, you don't, you don't, it'd be one thing if he made a show that lasted two years, five years, and then went off and fucked off and did other things, but you don't spend your entire life in a medium that you despise. I think he really liked components of it, and I think he also saw the, the flaws and damaging effects that it was having on, you know, its corrosivity on American culture throughout the late 1960s, early 70s, and, you know, early 80s, which I think is inarguable. I think... TV fundamentally shifted public discourse in that in in our country and and globally, um, and it's the same conversations that we're having right now about social media. Where we're like, is it really good for us to be on our fucking phones all the time? Probably not. You know, like 
moderation isn't a terrible thing, uh, turns out, but humans are really bad at moderation, turns out. Um, and so I just don't, I don't really buy that he, like, thought all TV was inherently bad. He just is, like, a dude who's, like, you know, I'm sure Michelangelo woke up one morning and was, like, yeah, and this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, fucking giant thing of marble, it's uh, looking okay, but, you know, it'd probably be better if I, like, sculpted it, uh, you know? Yeah, I mean, you, uh, this is, we're, this is not virgin territory in this show whatsoever, so you could be very right that... This is just a kayfabe origin story, but the 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 origin story it does happen to be that uh, he grew up playing with puppets by himself in his room, and then not really having much exposure to TV, and then later on in his like late teens, early twenties, kind of sitting down and watching TV, kind of the, for the first time, and then just like hating it and being like, "This is bad. Kids shouldn't be watching this. I guess I'll." make a show myself so that there's like at least some option for these kids. But see that even that in and of itself is an inherently what I'm saying. That's I'm look, I'm seeing that the medium is not utilized correctly. And therefore I'm going to try and put my effort into maximizing this medium's potential because it's the one that people consume the most. It's the most virulent form of media our country is currently engaged with, you know? Yeah, for sure. And like I said, you could be totally right. This, is, we, this isn't the first time that somebody has had a fabricated kayfabe origin story that was deeply exaggerated to sell themselves. Yeah, I mean, it's not even the first time that one of us has had a kayfabe origin story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, who knows? Who knows how much of what you say is a lie? It's true. Yeah. After graduating from Rollins, he worked at NBC in New York City as floor director of Your Hit Parade, The Kate Smith Hour, and Gabby Hayes Children's Show, and as an assistant producer of The Voice of Firestone. Ever heard of any of those things? Nope. In 1953, Rogers returned to Pittsburgh to work as a program developer at public television station WQED. Josie Carey worked with him to develop the children's show The Children's Corner, which Carey hosted. Rogers worked off-camera to develop puppets, characters, and music for the show. He used many of the puppet characters developed during this time on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, such as Daniel the Striped Tiger, who was named after WQED's station manager, Dorothy Daniel. Dorothy gave Rogers a tiger puppet before the show's premiere. Daniel Tiger now has his own cartoon on PBS called Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood and uses the same theme song as Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Won't you be my tiger? National Educational Television presents The Children's Corner with Josie Carey, produced by WQED for the Educational Television and Radio Center. Why, hi, don't I know you? Why, hi, I'm sure I do. Why, hi, you know me too. Why, hi, how do you do? Why, hi, I'm Josie. Why, hi, how do so you... So you see the early shades of what Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood is going to become. Clearly, you know, there's a clear influence of him behind the scenes, like, kind of guiding the vibe of that, you know? Mm-hmm. I needed that I needed that song to be a little bit faster and I needed that camera to push in a little bit closer to that person. Yeah, I mean, we're 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 in the six we're in the early 60s here. We we're, we're working with early television. The Children's Corner won a Sylvania Award for Best Locally Produced Children's Programming in 1955 and was broadcast nationally on NBC. While working on the show, Rogers attended Pittsburgh Theological Seminary and was ordained as a Presbyterian minister in 1963. He also attended the University of Pittsburgh's Graduate School of Child Development, where he began working with child psychologist Margaret McFarland, who, according to Rogers' biographer, Maxwell King, became his key advisor and collaborator and child education guru. Much of Rogers' thinking about and appreciation for childhood was shaped and informed by McFarland. She was his consultant for most of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood's scripts and songs for 30 years. He finally graduated magna cum laude from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. His mission, however, as an ordained minister, rather than being a pastor of a church, was to minister to children and their families through television. He regularly appeared before church officials to maintain his ordination. Which is another thing that's like kind of interesting because like, there's, there are no religious connotations to Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood whatsoever. There isn't even, like, symbolically religious connotations. I almost kind of feel like that's inaccurate to say that he, like, he, his, he chose to mission through children's television because, yeah, there's, there's, there's just no, there's, there's, there's no, like, weird 
religious aspect of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. He kept it very, very theologic, secular and real theologically agnostic, um, which is another, you know, I, I, I don't like shows that like weirdly have like veiled religious stuff in them. Like even if you're like, I don't care about being religious or whatever, but like the idea of like subtly feeding that to children during their development stages when they just are not like psychologically ready to like grapple with that just makes me kind of uncomfortable. In 1963, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in Toronto contracted Rogers to develop and host the 15 minute black and white children's program, Mr. Rogers. Stylized is just one word with the R and Mr. and Rogers shared. It lasted from 1963 to 1967. Oh, is it time to go back now? Oh, yes, the time did pass quickly. Well, we'll have a good big sleep tonight because tomorrow is just waiting to be another day for you. Man, look at that set. Yeah, it begins, it begins the sort of iconic visual from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood of the show taking place in his house and there being this elaborate train set which carries over to Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Tomorrow, we'll start the day tomorrow with this. But just look at that 1950s dude. Man, his hair is so black. Yeah. It's, it's, it's black and shiny and smooth. It looks like, it looks like plastic. Soon will be tomorrow and be our... It looks like one of those like stylistic Lego people. Little dinosaur in a boat. Who the fuck is this guy? He so on this show he had like several other hosts that were on the show with him. Um, and, and on Mister Rogers' Neighborhood, it, he was the central host, and then he would have like friends who would come visit him like Mr. McFeely and the mailman and stuff. But on this show, there was like other hosts that were also on the show that were like kind of shared the duties with him. There was this guy and then like a woman, um, which I don't know if it'll show her, but man, that last shot of him blowing a kiss at the camera, little creepy. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I think, and as much as I love this show, I, I will, I will be fully transparent in saying that with Mr. Rogers, as a person, he possesses something that I'm going to just coin the phrase right now as like the sense, the uncanny sincerity valley, which which is that like he's such a sincere human being and he exudes such innocent sincerity in any anything and everything that he did that to a normal, modern, slightly jaded person it can cross over into seeming creepy. And there are, there are moments in Mr. Rogers neighborhood uh, that definitely like with our modern goggles of, you know, being skeptical of everything and everything is ironic and society weirdly training us to be allergic to sincerity. It it, kind of comes off as a little bit of a, creepy vibe for sure it was the first time rogers appeared on camera cbc's children's programming head fred rainsbury insisted on it telling rogers fred i've seen you talk with kids let's put you yourself on the air combs joined rogers in toronto as an assistant puppeteer rogers also worked with combs on the children's show butternut square from 1964 to 1967 he acquired the rights to mr rogers in 1967 and returned to pittsburgh with his wife two young sons and the sets he developed despite a potentially promising career with CBC and no job prospects in Pittsburgh. I love that he was just like, all right, you know, I was doing this show and I had a great time, but I'm getting the fuck out of here and I'm taking my sets with me, motherfuckers. Like he just, he just fucking took the sets. Won't you be my unionized grip, key grip, because I need somebody to load this shit out of here because I really don't want to stay in Canada it's interesting though. Cause I think it speaks more to the idea of this, like this centralized unified vision. Like this wasn't just some cookie cutter thing where he did a show and then he could go to another city and just do the show again somewhere else. Like he had, he built these sets and all these puppets and they were a part of it. Like he had to have those in order to be able to do the thing that he wanted to do. Well, the thing I'm interested in is like, how did he get the sets? I mean, I guess it was the 60s and people weren't as proprietary about intellectual property, especially for children's programming TV. 
but like how much money did he have to give them to get all of the sets and the rights to mr rogers back and like what would have happened if he didn't get the rights like would we would he would he have been able to pitch himself without the kind of you know carrot and the stick of like i own the rights to a tv show that lasted four years and i want to do it again but here in the states but i already have the sets so you don't you don't have to put up any money for that stuff pbs i can like i have all the puppets and i have all the connections like i i just need a venue you know i'm curious about that transition there yeah it's almost like it's almost like the the inverse of these classical ideas of a brand being built and then turning into this massive corporate juggernaut because like it like we said earlier he created this character of daniel tiger on this original show that he worked on that wasn't even Mr. Rogers or Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. It was some different show. He created the character of Daniel Tiger, which was a which was a puppet that he voiced. And then he just took that character over to Mr. Rogers. And then he took that character over to Mr. Rogers Neighborhood on PBS. And now all these years later on PBS, there's just a cartoon of this character that he created on some different Canadian show in the 60s. Yeah, the legal the legal mumbo jumbo for that. I'm I'm very curious how how he was able to finagle that. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. And when my kids watch Daniel Tiger, I'm just like, if only you knew about the story of this tiger. He once had the assassination of Robert Kennedy explained to him, which we will get to. We 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 will watch we're we're going to watch that. Two, the kids are all right. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, also called The Neighborhood, a half-hour educational children's program starring Rogers, began airing nationally in 1968 and ran for 895 episodes. It was videotaped at WQED in Pittsburgh and broadcast by National Education Television, which later became the Public Broadcasting Service, also known as PBS. Its first season had 180 black and white episodes. Each subsequent season, filmed in color and funded by PBS, the Sears Roebuck Foundation, and other charities consisted of 65 episodes. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood tackles many difficult topics, including assassination, the Challenger explosion, and inviting a black man to dip his feet in a kiddie pool with him on a hot day during a time period when many people in America were fighting to segregate public swimming pools. This era of the show is also incidentally where this strangely dark episode came from, where one of the other actors on the show explains the Robert Kennedy assassination to Daniel Tiger, voiced by Rogers. Rogers said that he felt it was important to explain death to children during a very traumatic time when coverage of the assassination was either A, way too gruesome and adult for children to process, or B, way too patronizing and talking down to kids. He thought there should be someone to explain it to them somewhere in the middle, and this is the result. Where's Betty? Peekaboo! Peekaboo! Once more. Where's Betty? Peekaboo! So we've got this oh, like this best when you actor or host or whatever, Betty. And, and, I'm, and, and she's talking married. to Daniel Tiger, which is a little hand puppet a voiced by Rogers. Okay. Wonder what? It's a balloon. He pulls out a balloon and asks her to blow it up. up for me? Surely. She's blowing up the balloon. Mm. Pretty. Now, would you let the air out? Already? Yes, there's something I want to ask you. He's slowly letting the air out of the balloon. Slowly letting it out, really taking her time with it. Daniel Tiger's just kind of watching. Where's all the air that was inside? It's it's out in this air now. You mean it's all part of the big air? That's it. Well, what about your air? 
My my air inside me? Mm-hmm. What if you blow all your air out? Then you won't have any left, just like the balloon. But people aren't like balloons, Daniel. When we blow air out, we get some more back in. Watch. I'll blow air out. Oh. Does assassination mean? <laughs> it's just the fucking hard left turn. <laughs> I heard that word a lot. <laughs> yes. And I didn't know what it meant. Well, it means somebody getting killed in a a sort of surprise way. That's what happened, you know. That man killed that other man. I know, and a lot of people are talking about it right now. Too many people are talking about it. A lot of people are sad and scared about it, you know. I'd rather talk about it some other day. Whenever you like. Did you know that X and Lady Elaine are going to have a picnic today? Would you like to come? Mm. I don't feel... The first time I ever watched that clip, I was in an office, and I immediately went and gathered everyone around and queued it up and replayed it. And at that moment when he just out of nowhere hard pivots and says, what is assassin? What is assassination? Everybody just um, spontaneously started laughing out loud. Yeah, it really is what you were talking about of like the uncanny valley of of sincerity. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I I I totally get it and I totally respect what he was doing. But it's like a woman talking to a little tiger puppet and then and the, and him it's just it, you can't it, it's you it was you of a certain time. Yes. It was of a certain time, Spandrew. Yeah, it's it's I like I said I I respect it, but it's I, I think there we've talked about this before, but uh, everything from like the 1960s prior was just creepy. And and this is one of those things. You're not wrong. But all of that was threatened when Nixon decided to end PBS's funding during the height of the Vietnam War. On May 1st, 1969, Fred Rogers testified before the Senate subcommittee explaining how important PBS is for helping children. All right. So, yeah, we're, we're watching this infamous clip of. Uh, Fred Rogers testi- testifying in front of Congress and basically single-handedly convincing them to not defund. Do you now? Sure. All right, Rogers, you got the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Pastore, this is a philosophical statement and would take about ten minutes to read, so I'll not do that. Oh. Uh, One of the first things that a child learns in a healthy family is trust. And I trust what you have said that you will read this. It's very important to me. I care deeply about children. My first children... Will it make you happy if you read it? I'd just like to talk about it, if it's all right. My first children's program was on WQED 15 years ago and its budget was $30. Now, with the help of the Sears Roebuck Foundation and National Educational Television, as well as all of the affiliated stations, each station pays to show our program. It's a unique kind of funding in educational television. With this help, now our program has a budget of $6,000. It may sound like quite a difference, but $6,000 pays for less than two minutes of cartoons. Two minutes of animated 
what I sometimes say, bombardment. I'm very much concerned, as I know you are, about what's being delivered to our children in this country. And I've worked in the field of child development for six years now, trying to understand the inner needs of children. We deal with such things as, as the inner drama of childhood. We don't have to bop somebody over the head to make him, to, to make drama on the screen. We deal with such things as getting a haircut or the feelings about brothers and sisters and the kind of anger that arises in simple family situations. And we speak to it constructively. How long a program is it? It's a I'm... half hour every day. This dude hated Looney Tunes. Most channels schedule <laughs> this dude is just like Chuck Jones well is Satan. WTA <laughs> here has scheduled. I remain like convinced that there has never been so quite as evil or insidious a person today, like as like Walt Disney. I'd like to see the program itself or any one of them, you see. We, Mostly we because of how he fucked over Ub Iwerks. I love those cartoons those are the only ones i like he's just a huge iwerks head in boston and pittsburgh and chicago all came to the fore and said we've got to have more of this neighborhood expression of care and this is what this is what i give i give an expression of care every day to each child to help him realize that he is unique i end the program by saying You've made this day a special day by just your being you. There's no person in the whole world like you, and I like you just the way you are. And I feel that if we in public television can only make it clear that feelings are mentionable and manageable, we will have done a great service for mental health. Uh, I think that it's much more dramatic that two men could be working out their feelings of anger. Much more dramatic than... Mr. Rogers tried to prevent Andrew Tate. I'm constantly concerned... Mr. Rogers is just like, I think OnlyFans is a wonderful resource for positive sexual exploration. But it does concern me how there's a disturbing trend of pimps... Yes. using the platform the to decentralize the, music, the sex workers the from their means of income. The sex work is work. <laughs> They're just like, what the well, fuck I'm are you talking about? We're talking about PBS. Bumps, but for your interest in, in our kind of communication, could I tell you the words of one of the songs which I feel is very important? Yes. Here's the crescendo. This has to do with that good feeling of control, which I feel that the children need to know is there. And it starts out, what do you do with the mad that you feel? And that first line came straight from a child. I work with children do, doing puppets in, in very personal communication with small groups. What do you do with the mad that you feel? When you feel so mad, you could bite when the whole wide world seems oh so wrong and nothing you do seems very right. What do you do? Do you punch a bag? Do you pound some clay or some dough? Do you round up friends for a game of tag or see how fast you go? It's great to be able to stop when you've planned a thing that's wrong and be able to do something else instead and think this song. I can stop when I want to, can stop when I wish, can stop, 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 any time. And what a good feeling to feel like this and know that the feeling is really mine. Know that there's something deep inside that helps us become what we can. For a girl can be someday a lady and a boy can be someday a man. I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> Looks like you just earned the $20 million.
He just fucking went in there and beat poetry to his money. <laughs> yeah, he was like, and now I will construct a song that is definitely an original song that I am not making up off the top of my head. <laughs> my name's Fred Rogers, and I'm here to say... I know we talked about this uncanny sincerity valley or whatever, but like I, I would I wish I had the ability to persuasively argue in, in that common collective of, of a way. Can you can you imagine like the the, the January 6th committee and just like I just think that if you really look at the data and the timeline of events, it's clear from the sequence of how the event transpired that Donald Trump was directly responsible for inciting the violence that occurred on the in the Capitol that day. And as such, I think that he should be barred from any eligibility for running for president in any time in the future. Well, I just think it's amazing. I just think it's amazing. And then just fucking the world, just like peace is achieved and everything is great for the rest of the time. Is is Fred Rogers the only person who disproves the axiom of you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Yeah, I think so. Cause yeah, he, he, uh, he had a, he had a great run. He, fo- he died in his eighties. And like I said before, he's, he's whatever the opposite of the problematic fave is. He's just, he's just squeaky clean. The craziest thing that's ever been said about him is that his wife said that he liked to fart. <laughs> <laughs> Like that's even like that negative of a thing. <laughs> that's no, I know it's like, not negative at all. It's just that's that's the that's the that's the most like oh I never I didn't think that w- that would be the case about Mister Rogers. I mean I know that this is not something we're ever going to know, and this is not something the public should know. But the fact that he's so squeaky clean just makes you really curious about what his sex life was like. Yeah, I mean, of course, one uh, your mind reels of wondering. You know, you just you just have to think like, oh, there's there's got there had to have been some something weird like that we'll never know. But there there had to be something weird. That's the, your, your mind. Your mind goes there. Even if he does have some sort of fetish or kink or whatever, it's probably something super normal. You know what I mean? Like he's just like, I really like I really like foot jobs. You know what I mean? Like it's nothing like that, <laughs> that aggressively, you know, uh, controversial. You know, it's not like he's like, yeah, I love uh consensual non-consent you know <laughs> he's not he's not he's not in that ballpark or at least you know what i mean like i i feel like it, i would think it's perfectly normal if there was something weird because he's so straight laced about everything else that it just you, you there has to be some bizarre aspect somewhere to him i just you know i just like to be dressed up in my little diapy and fed my milkies you know sometimes i wake up in the morning and i'm like um I don't feel like being Fred Rogers today. I feel like being uh, Thundar Twinchelchocks, the wolf man, which is why I commissioned this werewolf suit. Um, and um, yeah, I just go in the backyard and run around with the dogs and yeah, we all get red rockets together. He's one of those those people that dress up in those like those BDSM and dog outfits and have like a person that like walks them and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Funding for PBS increased from 9 million to 22 million. After this paved the way for decades of the neighborhood and the litany of fun facts, little known but heartwarming moments, and sometimes hilarious situations that occurred throughout the course of the show. For instance, Rogers seemed to have a particular fixation on thinking that certain movies and TV shows were too scary for kids and that it was his personal responsibility to effectively break the movie magic kayfabe right on this show. There was this time that he had the actor who played the Wicked Witch of the West on The Wizard of Oz, Margaret Hamilton, on the show and proceeded to ask her to slowly dress up in her witch costume from the movie in order to show kids that it was just a kindly old woman under all that makeup. My favorite episode of The Neighborhood was one that featured Margaret Hamilton. One of the movies that she played in was called The Wizard of Oz, and she played the part of the Wicked Witch of the West. There were a lot of stories that I've heard from adults even saying how much that movie has scared them when they were watching it as a child. And they say, as a matter of fact, I'm still scared watching it as an adult. So I mentioned to Fred, Fred wrote his own material. I said, you know, maybe there's something we can do 
about scary images, which is being part of that. And as a matter of fact, Margaret Hamilton is a big fan of the program because she watches with her grandchildren. I had read a letter that she wrote to the, uh, the TV magazine in New York. Tell you that you're a real lady. Tell you that you're to these civilian clothes, but put it on. It's helping me just to see you get into these things. Oh, well, I'm glad. To know that you're a real lady who got dressed up to play this part. The purpose of the whole episode is that it helped children uh, know that it was pretend. Girls and boys like to play witches. Yes, don't they do. They? Yes, they certainly do. And when you feel as if you'd like to play something a little bit scary, a witch is a fine thing to play. She said, in fact, looking at the camera, she said, uh, you know, I'm not a scary person, but I. Dave, look, looking at these videos of Mr. Rogers throughout the years, have you have you caught on to the fact that Mr. Rogers is my style icon? <laughs> that is so on point. Oh my god, that is so on point. <laughs> Oh my god, that is so incredibly on point. Holy shit. I had never put that together, but yes, a hundred percent. You are Mr. Rogers if he secretly moonlighted at a tech company or a media company. Oh my god. I mean, just look at just look at this. Just look at this. It's this just this brief little shot here. Well <laughs> that Halloween party was a bust. Well, hey, at least the punch isn't bad. You didn't have punch. Oh, by the way, there was some fluid leaking from the attic above the kitchen, so I stopped. Like. That I, is a short <laughs> that Spandrew appeared in. In Were you in high school when you did that? How old were you? Oh, no, this was this was 10 years ago, it says. Oh, my God. So good. So good. So good. I respect your commitment to the bit. Or the time he visited Lou Ferrigno in his trailer on the set of The Incredible Hulk and seemingly forced him under duress to swear that he doesn't actually become violent when he gets mad in real life. Yeah, that's right. They don't think the Hulk was real. And you're a real man, Lou Ferrigno. Mm -hmm. But you get made up to look like the Hulk. Uh-huh. But on the program, you sort of take the place of Dr. Banner, don't you? I mean, he turns into Metamorphic somebody. Metamorphic into the Hulk. Into the Hulk. But you're two different people. Uh-huh. And what I'm interested in is now when you get angry, you, Lou Ferrigno, get angry, what, uh, what do you like to do? I mean, what do you do when you get angry? You don't, you don't turn cars over and jump out windows or things like no, that. No, thank God. But uh, everyone will get angry. And uh, I'm able to control that. Maybe they get made of myself, and that will lead to the frustration I take out from training. But what do you mean by training? Well, training with weight, bodybuilding, and that uh, requires many hours of grueling training and uh, sweating and panting, and uh, it's something that lifting uh, a tremendous amount of weight. Just like the visual juxtaposition of the two of them body. sitting there were. Ferrigno's so, like in like tidy whiteies and just like massive. Like he's just huge. I'm interested to in the kinds of things. That yeah, he's 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 massive and he's completely shirtless. So he's he's like he's wearing like the 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 Hulk fucking costume, except for he's not painted. Bro, saying he's shirtless is underselling it. He's shirtless and pantsless. He's literally sitting there in tidy whiteies. Yeah, and just and just like massive. He's like a fucking tree giant. Sitting next to Mr. Rogers. I've interviewed Lou Ferrigno, and I can uh, attest that he's a very large man. But I interviewed him when he was like, you know, 65 or whatever. That Lou Ferrigno is like twice the size of the Lou Ferrigno that I interviewed. Yeah. And I get that like part of this might be him concentrating on trying to read his uh, Mr. Rogers lips. But he does not seem like he's enjoying this. Like he seems like he's apprehensively doing this. Uh, that's that was my experience. Ferrigno was not necessarily like, uh, you know, I don't want to say the nicest of guys <laughs> when I met him. But, you know, maybe uh, maybe I just caught him on the wrong day. Who knows? 
The funny thing is that when you interviewed him, you were just a- you were asking the same questions. You're like, you know, is it true that whenever you get angry that you don't smash cars? Is that right, Lou Ferrigno? And he's like, uh, yeah, no, I don't, no. And you're like, yeah, but like you're you're just a regular man, right? You're not like a an angry monster. And he was just like, no, what, no, I'm not. Like, what, what is this? What am I doing yeah, right now? Yeah, it's funny because you can tell that Lou Ferrigno is not in on the joke. He's like expecting an actual interview. And then there's this little, like, little cardigan wearing doofus asking him if he's a real man. And he's like, what? Yeah, I'm a real man. What are you talking about? Yeah. And but this was this was something that like that Mr. Rogers was like obsessed with was like he was like the fucking myth busters of scary monsters on tv he he felt like he had to go around and just like break all kayfabe because he he was just like i just want to let the kids know that there aren't these scary monsters in the world and i want to just demystify them and he did this a lot on the show but that one's the funniest one to me because it just seems like lou ferrigno is just like not interested in doing it and somebody just like forced him to or how about the fact that Rogers himself, as a music major, composed all of the music for the show, and none of it was pre-recorded. There was an in-studio pianist who played for every episode live during taping, and the pianist happened to be a renowned and semi-famous improvisational jazz player named Johnny Costa, who worked on the show just simply because he liked Rogers. And because of this, every single version of the opening song, Won't You Be My Neighbor, was slightly different because the guy playing the piano was a savant genius who could play the same song a million times and make it intricately unique each time. He is one of the most gifted musicians that I have ever met. He is probably one of the finest jazz pianists in the world. Well, with that kind of music, you couldn't help but find inside there an exceedingly sensitive man. she is a gifted sensitive man son needs for this next year of college i'll do it so that's how that began when i first started to work with fred i mean i was real and i mean a real jazzer you know and and i thought well i don't know Joe's program well, I just wonder, can I play the things that I'm, I've been playing, that I want to play, you know? And uh, Fred didn't care. And so when I play uh, Good Feeling, you know, I didn't do it for the years of a child. I didn't do it this way. I wouldn't do that, so I figured, well... And Fred loved it, and... Uh, and I, I kept doing it, and the people loved it. He is one of the most... The thing, the thing about this, this show that I, like, I don't think anybody talks about is that it was like a technical marvel. Like, it, this was a, a live-to-tape show where F- Fred Rogers is, like, walking around this elaborate set with all these puppets and these trains going by and all this shit, and he's just singing songs live with a piano player accompanist who is like, not just like, oh, I'm just going to play this song based on the sheet music, but he's like fucking going to town, improv everything and doing every song different every single day. And Mr. Rogers is just singing along with him and they're keeping time and doing everything right. And this whole, like, it's fucking insane. Like this show was like a technical masterpiece. But like effortless, I don't think you, I don't think you watch it and think that. I don't think you watch it and you're like, oh my god, how do they do this? You just kind of watch it and it just is what it is. But the way that they did it was like fucking crazy. It was like those episodes of The Twilight Zone that they shot like live multicam. Speaking of his music, he also famously advocated for the disabled community and fostered diversity in the neighborhood far beyond the racial kind when he invited a boy named Jeffrey Erlanger on the show to talk about his disability and sing one of Roger's songs, It's You I Like, with him. Special. Mr. Rogers? 
Hey, Jeff. <laughs> I'm glad to see you. Hi. Thank you very much for coming by. Can you tell my friends what it is that made you need this wheelchair? Sure. Well, when I was about seven months old, I had um, I had a tumor, and it broke the nerves to tell my hands and legs what to do. I see. And I got a wheelchair when I was four years old. That was your first one mm -hmm. when you were four. Uh-huh. He told Jeff before they started that they would have a chat and then sing a song together. I think he said we might sing a song. Yeah. I remember because yeah. I mean I was sort of surprised. What well, he's going to start singing a song? Well, you know, this is totally not even what song. <laughs> it's you, I like. It's not the things you wear. It's not the way you do your hair. But it's you, I like. The way you are right now, the way down deep inside you, not the things that hide you, not your fancy chair, that's just beside you, but it's you I like, every part of you, your skin, your eyes, your feeling, whether old or new, I hope that... The crazy thing about this is that Mr. Rogers was, like, way ahead of his time with, like, dealing with and talking about, um, interacting with and the the way in which we regard uh, disabled children, Um because you know, through basically, I don't know, I don't know how familiar you are with this, but throughout the, throughout the like the the late '90s and into the 2000s, and for the last you know like 20, 15 so years, whatever, um, uh, child development around disablement has had kind of went into this trend of something called person first language, which is essentially. It was thought of as this better it was it was an evolution of the way that people were treated before, which was like they're invalids, like you have this disability that makes you a burden on society. And uh psychology around people with, with uh disabilities evolved into this mainstream idea of person first language, which is like you're first and foremost a person before you are a person that has this disability. So uh, you would refer to somebody as like, this is Cindy, a beautiful little girl that has Down syndrome. Um, or, you know, this is Alex, a very smart young man who has autism. And I mean, it was certainly better than it was than what was done before. But in the last five or so years, or maybe before that, I'm not an expert on this, but in the last five or so years, um, person first language has sort of fallen out of favor and it's sort of been kind of regarded as actually kind of being toxic and, and negative because it essentially um, strips disabled people of their sort of autonomy and their humanity. It's like kind of dancing around their disability and being like, you know, you're, you're, you're a special person and you're a human being and you you are just, you know, you, you're dealing with a curse. Like you have this bad thing about you, but like, it's okay because we still love you. Like that's kind of the, that's what the essential idea of person first language is, is like you have this bad thing about you, but you're still good and we still like you. Um, and now we've evolved into this idea that like, you know, people should embrace their disabilities and they shouldn't be thought of as less human because of it. You know, instead of saying, this is Alex, a young boy with, with autism, you say, this is Alex, he's autistic. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it is what I am. It is, it is who I am and it, there's nothing wrong with it. And Mr. Rogers was doing that on the, on the, uh, Mr. Rogers neighborhood back in the fucking eighties. Like he was way ahead of the game. But also I feel like you just blew by that, like the raw emotion of that clip of just like, holy shit. And, and it, it serves, it serves 
as a perfect example of everything you were just saying of like the reason the show works so well is because of this you know delicate navigation of the uncanny valley of sincerity but also the fact that it's this technical marvel of you know there's this piano player who's a world-class improvisational jazz pianist and you know fred rogers is always in the moment and committed and there like even just on like a sheer performance level like i've been in scenes with people where they're not there they're not listening to me they're not reacting to me they're not in the same emotional you know kind of space vibrating at the same frequency and like the calmness of what fred rogers is doing and the space that he's allowing for this young boy to be incorporated into what they're you know he and the piano player are doing like aside from the obvious human to human connection which is happening that on a performance level is just like mesmerizing it's It's like watching Michael Jordan, you know, like it's like, how does somebody do that? And it's effortless for him. It's it's so impressive. Yeah. And and he's he's letting he's letting Jeffrey like lead the situation and talk about himself instead of what, you know, would happen is like, here's little Jeffrey and he has this disability and this is what he's doing. So, you know, and let's talk about what you know, like I said, the person first thing of like, and let's talk about what his hopes and dreams and things like that. Instead of that, he's like, hello, Jeffrey, tell us about yourself and tell us why you, you know, why you're in this chair. And he lets him lead the conversation and talk about himself the way he wants to talk about himself. And yeah, like you said, it's just, it just feels effortless. And it's like, man, I, like I said before, I wish, I wish I had this level of like, like, yeah, it's, it's the, it's the uncanny valley of sincerity, but also, I wish that I had the ability to be that in the moment and that uh, that able to just kind of effortlessly coexist with other people, you know? Nah. Psych. I just made all that up. Fuck this guy. <laughs> Which led to this utterly heartwarming moment years later when Rogers was inducted into the TV Hall of Fame and the surprise presenter was a grown-up Jeffrey. Oh, my God. I'm not ready for this. Oh, my God. Please welcome Jeffrey Erlinger. Just watch. Is that his wife? No, I don't know who that is. <laughs> That's Murphy Brown. That's all. I know that for sure. I'm honored to be here tonight to be part of your proud moment. This proud moment, you know, when when you tell people that it's you, I it's you I like. You, we know that you really mean it. And tonight, I want to let you know that on behalf of millions of children and grown-ups, it is you that I like. The best part about this clip, which is certainly lost on the listener, but also might not even be obvious if you're watching it, is that like Jeffrey comes out onto the stage and he's supposed to like introduce uh, Rogers and kind of like talk about him for a second and then, you know, invite him up to accept the award on stage. But the moment that he comes out on stage, Mr. Rogers just like climbs over chairs and climbs up onto the set. Like he just he he, he skips all pageantry and he just like climbs over theater seats and goes up onto the stage before he's supposed to. I am so glad you can't see me right now. <laughs> <laughs> Some... I, you don't even know. I am I am so glad that the Zoom has malfunctioned and you cannot see me right now. Yeah, so I, I might cut out the part where that actually happened. So just to recap it, at some point earlier in this episode, uh, Dave got like a call on his computer and for some bizarre reason, it just like shorted out his video feed. So I just can't see him right now. Uh, and apparently it was a serendipitous event. <laughs> that was uh, very wow. That Yeah, that was that was very good. And that was quintessential Mr. Rogers. I'm, I'm very whoever the producer was that was like, we got to get the, the kid 
from all those years ago to come give him his speech. That guy deserves an award or that girl deserves an award because goddamn. Yeah. On one hand, it's like very touching and very authentic and genuine. And then on the other hand, it's like some producer being like, we're going to get some fucking ratings. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, how can we bilk this situation for the most fucking eyeballs? Ah, get the little kid. The little kid who sang with him that one time. Get him. Are you talking about Jeremy uh, Erlinger, George? You know, he's a he's a person, George. He's not just a prop. I don't give a fuck if his name is Timbuktu. Get him here so Fred Rogers can make everyone cry. You're the head of PBS? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That was great. Yeah, it, it's it's pretty amazing. Or the time that a blind girl who listened to the show wrote into Rogers to say that she was concerned about his fish getting fed because she couldn't see if he was doing it. To which this was his response. Of course, things don't always turn out to be just the way we plan. But we'll make believe about that another day. Here you are, fish. So very subtle, very quick. uh, But from that moment on, every time he fed the fish, he would just say that he was feeding the fish out loud. It's funny because he had that he had that same approach every time um, he went into the backyard and put on his uh, wolf fucking outfit. He would go. There you are, weeds. I'm now going to mark you as my territory. Yep. So that the uh, the f- the blind furries in the- that were watching would know that he's doing it. For all the uh, blind dungeon daddies out there, for everyone who might be visually impaired but uh, enjoys a little uh, run around the paddock dressed like a lycanthrope, uh, just going to uh, how low to all of you out there in TV land. I mean, yeah, I, I I hesitate to even make fun of him because I can't stress how much I loved Mr. Rogers growing up. But like that dude had to be like fucking puppets or something. There's a reason why he's the one who puts his hands in all the puppets. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody picks it up and he's like, don't please don't put your hand inside, Daniel. That's my special place. You've been defiled, Daniel. I knew a guy in high school who did that. Fucked puppets. Yeah, kind of. He had like a dog. Not a dog. It was like a bear. He had a little bear that like, <laughs> it's just so crazy. I had completely forgotten this. I knew this guy in high school who was dating, he was dating the best friend of my high school girlfriend. So we unfortunately had to spend a lot of time with him and I was not particularly fond of him. Always gave me kind of a bad vibe. But when they broke up, <laughs> the, this best friend told me about this thing that he would do where he had a small stuffed animal that's like a you know like a bear like a winnie the pooh but it wasn't winnie the pooh you know it was like a copyright free bear or whatever stuffed animal he'd had since he was a kid and there had been a nat like a hole that had worn in the bottom of the bear (laughs) you could see where this is going he put his fucking dick in the bear hole and would like fuck it and come into it like every night which is just like crazy like That bear, that poor stuffed bear is just like filled with like years of dried cum. That's horrible. This is information that he offered up to his girlfriend? Apparently. I mean, she knew about it. I don't know if they got down with it and were experimenting with incorporating a third and that third being an inanimate bear that he would fuck and climax into. But yeah, that was that was the that was the word on the street. It was one. It's one thing to fuck a bear every night, but it's another thing to be like. Hey, babe, uh, you know, you want to know something funny? Uh, I, I do this weird thing where, like, when I go to the bathroom, I have to take off all of my clothes or I can't go. Like, I get naked in order to go to the bathroom. It's like, oh, that that is that is weird. You know what I do? I fuck a stuffed bear every night and it's full of my cum. <laughs> and I keep it and I don't wash it out. Like, it's just <laughs> like, Yeah. It's fucking surreal, man. There's also the fact that despite being a deeply religious Presbyterian minister, he was openly supportive of the LGBTQ community in a time when that was far less socially acceptable for even the more liberal of people. But then also he did some funny stuff, like the time he sued Ice Cube for royalties for featuring Won't You Be My Neighbor in the intro to one of his songs and was collecting money from a gangster rap song for years until Cube finally removed the clip from the song. I loved all the noise. you know. I left this is just some random live stream that... Ice Cube was doing on Instagram or something. It's a trip because off this song, Mr. Rogers sued us. He was mad because we had we had the Mr. Rogers theme at the beginning of this. It's a wonderful day in the neighborhood and all that. And uh, the nigga sued us and was getting like five cent a record till we took that part off. 
So this part, this it don't have it on here, but we took that off. That's just a fun fact, you know. Uh, <laughs> I love him calling it a fun fact. Fun fact: I got sued. That you, 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 you want to be so wealthy that you can. That's a fun fact. That that's a fun fact. Yeah. Not and not like a deeply traumatic thing that you just don't want to talk about. I used my rap money to buy a yacht. And fuck it, let's just watch his Lifetime Achievement Award acceptance speech just be fucking because it's a bleak, difficult world, and sometimes you just got to let yourself win. Oh, it's a beautiful night in this neighborhood. (laughs) So many people have helped me to come to this night. Some of you are here. Some are far away. Some are even in heaven. All of us have special ones who have loved us into being. Would you just take, along with me, 10 seconds to think of the people who have helped you become who you are? Those who have cared about you and wanted what was best for you in life. 10 seconds of silence. I'll watch the time. Looking at his watch, cutting away to daytime TV stars, tearing up. Whomever you've been thinking about, how pleased they must be to know the difference you feel they've made. You know, they're the kind of people television does well to offer our world. Special thanks to my family and friends and to my That's co-workers his wife. in public broadcasting, family communications, and this academy for encouraging me, allowing me all these years to be your neighbor. May God be with you. Thank you very much. You were my neighbor. All those years, Mr. Rogers, you were my neighbor. We're still neighbors, Fred. We're still neighbors. We're still. And I did think about all the people that watched me and and helped me and supported me. And it was all you. It was just you over and over again. Just your name. That whole 10 seconds. <laughs> but how did he save porn? Well, weirdly in two distinct ways. In 1972, the FCC made it a legal requirement for any cable provider in the top 100 U.S. television markets to set aside a channel for people to use. This came to be known as public access, where anybody could have a show as long as they showed up to the studio and followed a few simple rules. Those rules were significantly more lenient than those of the major networks, because public access channels weren't broadcast over the airwaves and didn't have to placate advertisers, their content ranged from monotonous to batshit crazy. The late night hours were the hot spot for an array of explicit material. If you lived in Austin, Texas, you could watch InfoSex, which featured gay men showing safe sex procedures in anatomical detail. In New York, you may have watched Midnight Blue, hosted by Screw Magazine publisher Al Goldstein, where strippers and porn stars did interviews completely nude. Seattle featured some of the filthiest material to ever hit public access. Channel 29 from Cablevision made a point not to review shows before they aired. All you had to do was drop off a videotape and show proof of ID so people pushed the limits of decency every night to a potential 100,000 viewers. Without Fred Rogers' push to save PBS and incidentally public access being made a legal requirement for cable providers, we may have never reached porn being more available for public consumption. It may have stayed only in private homes with homemade tapes being passed around instead of it being made for mass production to be distributed in sex stores around the world. But speaking of tapes... Here's the other way in which Rogers somehow single-handedly, albeit completely by accident, ensured the future of the adult industry. In the late 1970s, the VCR, a brand new device that could be hooked up to your television and record and playback any show or movie, was introduced to the United States by Sony. And naturally, with such a revolutionary and disruptive new product, some people weren't happy about it. In 1976, Warner Brothers and Disney brought a landmark case to the U.S. District Court asking for Betamax, which at the time was being looked at as the dominant home video format, despite the fact that it would be overtaken by VHS only a few years later, to be completely banned from sales in the United States. 
They claimed that the ability to record and replay movies and shows from television would severely cut into the profits of movie studios. The case was rejected in 1979, but in 1983, Warner Brothers appealed the decision. This time, the case was brought to the Supreme Court, and also Warner Brothers had much more lobbyist power behind them. Jack Valenti, the infamous head of the Motion Picture Association of America, the guy who brought us the U.S. movie rating system we know today, famously said, The VCR is to the American film producer and the American public as the Boston Strangler is to a woman home alone. It's a bit of a bit of an exaggeration there, I'd say. Yeah, I'd say it's a little, little too far. It was looking like Warners might actually win this time, and the VCR would be completely banned in the U.S. However, Rogers, a staunch advocate of the VCR because he felt like it helped kids watch TV sparingly and not become a slave to the programming schedule of network stations, testified during the trial. I have always felt that with the advent of all this new technology that allows people to tape the neighborhood off the air, they then become much more active in the programming of their family's television life. Very frankly, I am opposed to people being programmed by others. My whole approach in broadcasting has always been, you are an important person just the way you are, you can make healthy decisions. I just feel that anything that allows a person to be more active and in control of his or her life in a healthy way is important. So uh, Fred Rogers was a huge supporter of the v of the VCR simply because he thought that it helped people to not sit there and just like veg out watching network TV where they're just kind of like waiting for shows to come on and then like watching other shows while they're waiting for shows to come on. You want to watch a show at five and you want to watch a show at eight. So you watch the sh you watch the TV from five to eight and all the shows in between, even though maybe you wouldn't have necessarily watched the shows that happened in between or whatever. And that's why he supported the VCR. Uh, what what do you think he would think about today's world where it's that but on crack? Uh, I think I think uh, I can picture Fred Rogers going in front of Congress and being like, I think streaming is not so great. And I think phones are not so great. In fact, the only game that I play is Pokemon Go, because even though you can't battle your friends or really train up your Pokemon like you can in the old school Game Boy games it still encourages you to be active and go outside, which I think is good. Please shut it down. Please shut it all down. If we could just have a situation where it was all shut down, I think that would be great. Just turn, can you can you turn the internet off? Where's the, where's the button? I know that there's a situation where there's wires and tubes, but I really just feel that maybe we could just have less wires and less tubes. The Supreme Court ultimately ruled in favor of Sony and the VCR and explicitly credited Roger's testimony as being instrumental in their decision. He testified that he had absolutely no objection to home taping for non-commercial use and expressed the opinion that it is a real service to families to be able to record children's programming and to show them at appropriate times. The advent and popularity of the VCR in the late 70s and early 80s had actually delivered a huge windfall in the alien U.S. porn industry, which was struggling to survive in a country that was increasingly growing tired of having to go sit in a big group of people in a movie theater if they wanted to watch porn. If the VCR had been banned in the U.S., it's likely that the entire industry would have collapsed. Instead, the VCR caused a massive boom in porn and turned it from a kind of seedy back alley industry targeted at the cultural detritus of the country into the mainstream pastime it is today, all because people could watch it from the privacy of their own homes. Also, incidentally, Roger's testimony rippled outward and directly affected another industry. In addition to saving the VCR, this Supreme Court case also set a legal precedent that said that the manufacturer of a product that was capable of committing copyright infringement could not be held legally liable for any copyright infringement committed using their products as long as they could prove that the product had, quote, substantial non-infringing uses. The legal precedent would become instrumental in allowing file sharing companies like Napster to come into existence in the late 90s and get away with providing a platform where users could upload and share copyrighted music for free. Napster was able to legally squeak by for a while on this precedent up until an email written by Napster co-founder Sean Parker was leaked and presented as evidence in the court case that showed him acknowledging that he knew there was piracy being committed on the Napster platform. The email destroyed the company's plausible deniability that the legal precedent set by the VCR case protected, and the company quickly imploded. 
So would the modern porn industry and Napster, I guess, really have never existed if not for Roger's testimony? We may never know, but in spite of the late night provocative programming that lived on the same channels, Fred Rogers continued to make Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, the last episode airing on August 31st, 2001, when he was 73 years old. In his time in the public eye, he continued to speak out when he felt he needed to, including 1990, when the Missouri branch of the Ku Klux Klan used his name and someone impersonating him to try to recruit young children. A phone number was circulated in Independence, Missouri. One recorded message heard at this phone number was the fake Mr. Rogers identifying a young black child on the playground and using racial slurs, calling the child a drug pusher and ultimately lynching him. Another message targeted gay people, saying AIDS was divine retribution. It was discovered this phone number had been used earlier in the year to promote the ideology of the Missouri Division of the Klan. On October 9th, Rogers and his production company, Family Communications, Inc., sued the Klan and three men, Adam Troy Mercer, Michael Brooks, and Edward E. Stevens, for copyright infringement and to protect children from those messages. The following day, a federal judge issued a temporary restraining order to halt the Klan's use of the recordings, and the Klan and the men named in the suit had to turn over the tapes and other related materials. Less than 10 days later, the men signed settlements with Rogers and his production company. The trio agreed to destroy the tapes and not use any materials to imitate Rogers' show. However, the men claimed they were not members of the Klan and had that claim documented in the agreement. I mean, number one, I mean, this is, obvi this is obviously a great story. Uh... I shudder to think of how this would have gone today. You can imagine a court ruling in favor of the Ku Klux Klan saying that they're like exercising their right to like fair use, free speech or some shit. Um, but you love to, you, lo you love to see that. But what, what's your, what's your, what's your, uh, what's your reading on the, the idea that Mr. Rogers saved porn? Do you find it to be a compelling? Uh, I mean, I think that there's, I think there's interesting facets to it, but I think, I think that ultimately it falls kind of in this middle ground of kind of like the only real I mean, other than the late night stuff, like the the VHS argument, which I think is the more substantial um, in air quotes saved porn. That to me feels like just a little bit more reliant on chaos theory or like the interlinking of uh, unrelated but very important events after the fact by, uh, you know, people who have historical hindsight. I mean, by that, by that logic, you could say the same thing of like, you know, um, I insert president here saved the porn industry. You know what I mean? Because you could link a decision a president made to legislation getting passed to deregulation of, uh, you know, financial codes in fucking the valley in Los Angeles where they shot porn for years and years and years because of, you know, uh, the legal loopholes there that the California government uh, allowed them, you know, whatever. I don't know. I'm 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 speaking not with a specific example, uh, a, more just, yes, I understand why that case could be made. And I'm not even saying that it's not true. I'm just saying it's it, it that's the chaos theory of living life, right? Like you're going to have unintended um, unintended consequences and unintended ramifications based on your um, behavior. And thankfully that was actually one that worked out in Mr. Rogers favor, you know, like he helped foster this situation. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't like Mr. Rogers, uh, testified and saved the VCR and 30,000 people were executed in Indonesia a day later because yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you could also say that I personally wrote and drew Halloween boy because I gave you that air conditioner that one time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's pretty much, that's, a, that's a perfect example. That is a perfect example. Yeah. Um, because I literally would not have been able to draw this book if that air conditioner did not save my ass this summer. Um, but yeah, I was the one who fucking moved that pencil and we both know that you son of a bitch are always trying to take fucking credit for my shit. Yeah. I keep sneaking into the stores and like crossing out your name and writing mine and it's, it's, People aren't buying it. I don't I don't know. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird that no one's buying it. Yeah. It has also been speculated Rogers was bisexual due to a conversation with one of his friends, openly gay Dr. William Hirsch, where Rogers concluded that if sexuality was measured on a scale of one to ten. Well, you know, I must be right smack in the middle because I've found women attractive and I've found men attractive. Which like, holy shit. 
I don't know which thing I find more surprising, that the ultra-religious family minister, registered Republican Fred Rogers, so casually revealed his sexuality was on the spectrum back in the 90s, or that it wasn't bigger news and more controversial, considering the vocal contingent of bigoted shitbags in this country that pounce on stuff like that. In the Netflix documentary, Francois Scarborough Clemens, who played Officer Clemens on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, stated Rogers was not gay. This is all speculation, as Rogers has never outright said the words, I'm bisexual. It's possible that he didn't have the words at the time, or that he feared public reaction. He told Clemens, who is now an openly gay man, that he could not be out while on the show, as it could cause them to lose sponsors. In the Netflix documentary, Francois stated that Rogers did come around to it eventually, Later in the documentary, footage of a rally against Rogers is shown. Conservatives were rallying against him because he, quote, tolerated gays. In the last few weeks, there have been videos on TikTok about a song from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood titled Everybody's Fancy and how Rogers rewrote it when he learned of transgender people. Original lyrics included the line, quote, only girls can be mommies, only boys can be daddies, which were later changed to girls can grow up to be mommies, boys can grow up to be daddies. But of course, we all now know, after going on this grand explanation of his life, that Fred Rogers was the biggest daddy of us all, in every sense of that word. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember when the documentary came out and there was a there was a large discussion around there was a large discussion around kind of the the point that you had made earlier or the kind of nascent like it's the mid twenty tens and everyone's like, Oh, Fred Rogers was religious. He probably was a bigot. So everybody went looking for stuff. And they got nothing. They got well, that, fucking that's nothing. <laughs> you say that, you say that, but this point right here, I think, of him asking his, uh, you know, employee to stay in the closet or whatever, yeah. his fellow yeah. performer. Certainly. I think that, that A, was the point that people ended up finding, which for somebody from his generation in the way that he is sparkly, sprinkly, squeaky clean in every other aspect is a fairly minor thing to have discovered about someone because all humans are flawed everyone has misunderstood opinions or malformed uh verbiage or just wake, woke up on the wrong side of the day and was grumpy and wrong side of the bed one day and was grumpy to somebody and you know like everybody has those that's Ugh, what makes us i'm human. in such a bad mood you can't be gay <laughs> you know what I mean, though? Like, everybody has those instances, which is why the Internet fell in love with the idea that Fred Rogers was a was a sniper. And it also fell in love with the idea that Fred Rogers secretly had full sleeve tattoos. And like, there are all these kind of urban legends about him because it's so incomprehensible that his only flaw is that he just cared too much about people. Um, and I think, you know, I think, is there a dialogue to be had around... Um, this dude basically being like, hey, bro, you got to stay in the closet because we'll lose we'll lose sponsors. Yeah, I don't think that's cool. But on a scale of one to ten, do I think that he's wrong that they would have lost sponsors if they had an openly gay cast member? I don't know. Maybe. Um, But I feel like judging from the measured, uh, even tempered, fuck you, I'm going to chart a course to be the most progressive Republican in the history of fucking mankind. I feel like, uh, you know, Fred Rogers did pretty good. You know, like if this is the only thing that we're grumpy about, like he did stuff that outweighed this, in my opinion, you know, having a black man on TV to put his feet in a kiddie pool with him. I mean, that's that takes real cojones to stand up to the racists and be like, fuck you. Yeah. And it's also like it's it's that, but it's also like in kind of like a, a little bit of like a bitchy, petty way. Like it's kind of, it's funny that that was what it was. I mean, I know it's like a kid show or whatever, but like the fact that it was like, we're just going to stand in a little kiddie pool and all of you little bigoted shitheads can just fucking suck on that. Like it's, that's just, that's very funny to me. It's very yeah, funny. Yeah. And that's kind of, that's kind of why I'm like, I wonder why it was, I wonder why it was Clemens being gay that he thought it was going to lose sponsors when all the other stuff wasn't. Like that to me feels like there's more to that story. Like there must have he must have had some sort of interaction with like the head of Kellogg's fucking cereal or whatever their sponsor was at that time that gave him insight into that. Because this is a dude who consistently championed the underdog and spoke out for the benefit of people who needed help. And I find it really 
out of character, surprisingly that, you know, it, we're, we're, we're all surprised that this dude who's a Republican from the fucking 1950s ostensibly uh, is like down with the, the he, they's and the gays. A cab, brother, a cab. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's really fascinating, um, you know. You're lucky you're a mailman, Mr. McFeely, because if you were wearing a different uniform, I'd probably smash you over the head with a beer bottle right now. <laughs> I, yeah, basically, this is a long-winded and clumsy way of saying, I remember when this was a big discussion on the internet, um, I was initially very saddened to learn that this was a stance that Fred Rogers had taken, because I too love Fred Rogers, not as much as Freddy Krueger, but also, you know, the Freds. I just love the Freds. I didn't even, I didn't even think about that when I made that joke earlier. The, the, the fucking Freds. Yeah, well, you know, my, my, my big three, you know, the, the people on my Mount Rushmore, there's four of them. Uh, Fred Rogers, Fred Krueger, and then two men that worked under the joint name Right Said Fred. Hell yeah. Fucking Right Said Fred. Is that... I'm too sexy for this shirt, baby. Yeah, 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 yeah. yes. I, I, I was trying to figure out, I was trying to discern them uh, between Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Relax, don't do it. When you want to go to it. Yeah. Um. So, you know, I don't know. I, I don't, ultimately this, you know this um situation that the only thing people could find on him in air quotes was that he was not necessarily that cool to uh officer clemens not to downplay whatever trauma officer clemens le- lived through in order to um you know stay in the closet while he was on the show but in a career spanning 60 years where he pretty much was right on the money all the time i don't know this 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 to me seems like something that is um regrettable of its time but pales in comparison to the massive amounts of good that fred rogers has done he did okay he did okay that'll do pig whether he intended to save porn or not fred rogers left a beautiful legacy that has had a lasting impression on a few generations and will likely continue to leave an impression on many more and like yeah maybe the whole mr rogers saved porn angle is one of the most clickbaity things we've ever done But at the end of the day, it was just an excuse to talk about this great, great man. Imagine this, an empty stage, blackness, the quiet rustling of an audience. They're waiting for a performer to come out. Tip tap, tip tap, tip tap. One man walks into the darkened theater, jumps up on the stage. It's Fred Rogers. A spotlight illuminates his face. He looks out at the audience, contemplating all of their unique faces, these new friends that he's about to make. And then in in his uh, simple, understated drawl, Pennsylvania drawl, he just says, I'm too sexy for this sweater, too sexy for this sweater, and starts disrobing. And then as everyone starts getting into the jazz, tinkling music wafting out over the audience, he starts saying, I'm too sexy for this skin, this human skin, and starts slowly unraveling the meat connected to his skeleton. I'm too sexy for this consciousness, this consciousness. And slowly, a small, brilliant white orb floats out of the center of the being that is Fred Rogers and hovers over the audience before it turns into a hideous, malformed wolf creature and descends upon the audience and eats them, smash to black. That was that was an that was an eldritch horror that I was not prepared for. <laughs> Look, man, I'm just saying, if somebody wants to make a Mr. Rogers horror movie about him being obsessed with werewolves and willing himself into some sort of next level consciousness, psychic lycanthropian horror, get at me, baby. I'm here. That's actually kind of a cool idea, a werewolf movie about a Mr. Rogers style children's entertainer who is just a genuinely like sincere, great person who loves everybody and wants nothing but to like touch and help the children of the of the of the world. And then he becomes a werewolf. And then by night he is killing and eating people and dealing dealing with the dichotomy of that. Won't you be my victim? Yep, that's it. The, of course, the trailer for it is a slowed down, you know, uh, atonal minor key version of the Won't You Be My Neighbor song. Yeah, just uh, Jordan peel it up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Go, go full, go full, slip on a peel on that one. Mm-hmm. Slip on the peel. Fully uh, un- unfurling the peel. Well, yeah, you know, I, I, as I said before, uh, I, I love Mr. Rogers. I grew up as you did, and as you said before, I grew up 
watching a ton of PBS. Um, I watched a lot of shows on PBS. I watched Wishbone. I watched Ghost Rider. I watched Lamb Chop Sing Along. Um, I watched this one show, which I can't remember what it was called. It was called like Storytime Theater or something like that. It, it was like vignettes of like little stories that were – acted out like on sets, but they were, and they were live action and they, I, I don't even, I, some show, they, I, I liked it. I can't remember what it was called though. Um, and, but also first and foremost, watched a lot of Mr. Rogers. Uh, he was uh, greatly important to me as a kid, uh, mostly because I think I tend to gravitate towards people that are able to um, uh, express themselves uh, in a very sincere way and show genuine, um, emotional vulnerability, uh, because I feel like that's something that I have a def- deficit of. I, I find it very hard to express myself uh, emotionally. Uh, it's something I've always struggled with, and uh, I think I I I genuinely gravitate gravitate towards people who are like that because I see things in them that I sort of wish that I could do. And um, also, you know, growing up, I just I I don't think I had. Uh, many positive male role models. And so, you know, Mr. Rogers was somebody I could kind of look up towards in that way. Um, and I've rewatched the show uh, in recent years with my kids. Um, one time we went on a road trip and uh, I just loaded like 30 episodes of Mr. Rogers Neighborhood onto an iPad and we gave it to uh, Spenix Spub UK. <laughs> Oh, no, we gave it to Spay J the, the Sporth. That's who it was. Um, and uh, he watched several episodes of the show. And then eventually he took off the headphones and he said, I'm done with Mr. Robbins. And we've we've quoted that ever since. Um, but uh, I, I hope I hope that uh, I'm going to keep watching it with the kids. He was, he was maybe a little young to watch it at that time. He was like he was like one or two or something like that. Uh, but I'm going to keep watching it with the kids and. Hopefully, uh, they take away uh, a little bit of of uh, they, they they take away a little bit away from it, at least a fraction away from it that I did. Although um, I hope that they don't take as much away from it as I did, because I feel like a lot of the reason why it was so pop uh, so important to me was because I just didn't feel like I had the um, the male role model or the male presence in my life. And I hope that inspired by and supported by. Mr. Rogers, Mr. Fred Rogers, um, I am going to be that for my kids, and they won't need to have a Mr. Rogers-esque father figure. But I hope they at least like the show. Well, on that note, I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Spandrew Spice. This has been Deep Cuts. If you'd like to find me, you can do so on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, while it's still around, at xdavebakerx, or on the internet at heydavebaker.com. However... You used to be able to order a bunch of books there, but I'm kind of going to be shutting that down because, (laughs) ha ha, Davey boys, moving to France for a while, so I won't be here to mail shit. Um, But Spandrew Spice. Fucking pompous sellout. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, Spandrew Spice, where can people find you on lay internet? I think that's what they call it in my new home country. Yeah, exactly. That's, I mean, I was, I was in France recently and you just slap a lay on it and they, they get it. You can find me being led around on a leash, wearing my leather puppy dog costume by the marvelous widow, Mrs. Rogers, who in the years since her husband's passed away needs a new sub. And you can't find me on social media because I don't use social media. But if you want to pay your respects to the dear, beloved Papa Price, you can get his book, Deadbolt AI Private Eye, by going to dapricerights.com. You can also follow us on social media, going to Facebook, searching Deep Cuts Podcast. You can join our Facebook group, the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group, where we talk about the show and make memes. You can join our Discord server by going to bit.ly.com slash Discord. We talk about the show, make memes, talk about other things, play games. Currently, I have we're, we play this counting game where every person enters a number and then the person after that has to enter the next number in the sequence and you keep counting up as far as you can go. And uh, that sounds dumb and very simplistic, but 
you would be surprised how sla- how simultaneously fun and also challenging it is. Everybody who's joined the Discord and has been like, I don't get it. How could you lose this? You just count numbers. Inevitably, they are like, oh, I when you're when you, there's this much pressure, you forget how to count. And I currently have a deal going where if they can get it up to 300, I will name every person who was involved in the 300 number chain on the show. But they have yet to accomplish it. They have yet to get over like 180. It They always fail before they even get to 200. But if you want to join the server and help them get to 300, I will I will name you on an episode of the podcast. And you can also follow us on Instagram at Deep Cuts Pod. You can follow us on TikTok at Mystery Treehouse. You can go to our shop, deepcutspod.com. Click on the shop and you can get hats and shirts and other things with Deep Cuts graphics on them. You can get our Mystery Treehouse Junior Sleuth shoulder patch. And you can get out of here because the episode's over. Deep Cuts is a production by Boy Genius Media. If you'd like to find this show and others like it, please visit boygeniusmedia.com or deepcutspod.com. If you want to join in on post-episode discussions, please join the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. Finally, subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional video content. This episode was co-written by Spandrew Spice and special Deep Cuts guest writer Jay Bard. If you'd be interested in writing an episode of Deep Cuts, please email us at andrew at boygeniusmedia.com.